Thank you very much, everyone, for coming to hear what I have to say today um, about creative research methods, which is a topic that's generating a lot of interest. I'm, I'm getting quite big audiences like this at universities around the place, uh, which is lovely, um, because I think it's fascinating. And I hope to be able to explain quite how fascinating I think it is um, and convey some of that to you today. The reason I wrote the book, I've used creative methods myself in my commissioned independent research work for 15 years or more. Um, but I came up against a particularly complex research question a few years ago. And I was thinking, I, I'm not sure I've got the methodological tools I need. I think I need to read some more about methods. I need a book on creative methods. There's got to be one out there. Let me have a look. And I went on Amazon, and I looked, and I looked everywhere, and I couldn't find the book I wanted to read. So I thought, oh, OK, I've got to write another research methods book. So I did. And I basically just read a load of journal articles and methods books and compiled, kind of collated all that work. I think I read around 800 pieces of research and around 500 made it into the book and around 100 of those are um, showcased as boxed examples. So I learned a lot in that process. So I know some stuff. I don't know everything. I'm never, nobody is ever going to know everything about the field of creative research methods. It's too big and it's too fast moving. There's, new, there's a bunch of new stuff that's come out. The, book's, the book was published only last April. Um, and there's already a bunch of stuff that I know about that would have gone in if I'd known about it in time, but I couldn't have done because it hadn't been done yet. So it's, it's really fast moving. So this, this book really represents, in a sense, a snapshot of the field rather than some kind of authoritative, exhaustive everythingness. Um, but it's a start. And I'm getting very good feedback. People are telling me they're finding it useful. So uh, that's obviously very gratifying. When I was reading all that literature, um, I began to realize that the field could be conceptualized under four broad headings. These are not mutually exclusive, and they're just one way, perhaps, of describing the field, but they give um, some structure that makes it a little easier to talk about, to discuss uh, the field of creative research methods. So I'm going to run through each of these um, and have a couple of examples for you. So arts-based methods are very much, they're, they're often conflated with creative research methods. People think it's one and the same, but it's not. Arts-based methods are a big subset of creative research methods, but not by any means the whole story. And we're talking about all the arts, not just visual arts, um, not just written arts, also performance arts, music, everything, sculpture, collage, you name it, the whole lot. Um, there's almost a symbiotic link between research and the arts because arts techniques use research a great deal. So novel writers will go and research settings or find out about how helicopters work if they want a character who's a helicopter pilot or all that kind of thing. Um, artists, visual artists do different kinds of research, but they'll research perhaps perspective or different, the qualities of different materials and so on through all of the arts. Scenographers will um, do research for theatrical productions, all of this. But equally, the arts have a lot to offer to research. So at the, perhaps at one end of the spectrum, there's this kind of thing like, for example, poetic inquiry, where the arts practice becomes a research method, becomes a way of reflecting, investigating, going more deeply into poetry. It's great for trying to find the essence of something, um, even if you're not much of a poet, which I'm not. Um, and there are arguments that arts-based methods, that there's an ethical basis, a reason for using them in some research contexts. So working with children, I've done quite a lot of research with children. I haven't yet met a child who didn't respond well to the question, would you like to draw me a picture? Children really like drawing pictures. And if you ask them to draw you a picture about something or of something, they're really going to have a go at that and try, especially if you give them some nice colored pencils to do it with. Um, if you've got verbal language barriers for whatever reason, whether communication or cognitive difficulties or simply you don't speak a language in common with your participants, then arts-based methods are a great way to communicate and to find out and to investigate you know, what's going on um, with those people. And also very good for sensitive topics. Things that are hard to talk about can be easy to make a collage about or easier um, at least. So, some good applications um, for arts-based research. The big debate in the field <coughs> is, do you need to be an artist to be an arts-based researcher? 
There are people working at both ends of the spectrum again here. There's an American woman called Jane Pirto, who's a, an academic, quite senior academic, and she will not supervise doctoral students using arts-based research unless they are professional artists as well as researchers, because she feels very strongly that you need the equivalent level of skill. At the other end of the spectrum, there are people like Katrina Douglas here in the UK, whose view is very much that the arts are for everyone, very egalitarian approach. And her view is that as long as you're learning and trying your best, then it's worth using arts-based techniques in some contexts because that learning is what it's all about. And I think I'm probably somewhere in between. I can kind of see the point of both views. I think it depends on the context. If you're <coughs> analyzing visual data and you have a visual artist on your analysis team, they're going to bring a perspective to that analysis that is, has a depth and a richness in some respects that probably nobody else will have. On the other hand, other people who are not visual artists can also bring deep and rich perspectives, just different ones. Um, and if you're working, say you want to, I've done a couple of drama things with young people for um, presentation of findings because young people on the whole enjoy being involved in drama in some context or another. I'm not a drama professional, so I brought in a drama person a young people's drama professional to do the drama part and I did the research part and the young people did the young people part and it all worked fine. So there are options. Um, but it's, it's, that's, a, that's the big debate that's going on in the field at the moment and we haven't really got all the answers on that one as yet. So I'm going to give you an example now of arts-based research and this is a team that used the arts in analysis and dissemination because um, I've been talking mostly about it in terms of data, data gathering. But I think this was a really interesting piece of work from Canada. And the data collection was sort of fairly standard. An interview with patients shortly after they came out of intensive care and another one four to six weeks later when they were back at home. And in between those two interviews, they asked the patients to keep journals about their experiences. It's very much about finding out what the experience is like and helping other people to understand the experience that someone goes through when they have open heart surgery, which is obviously a pretty major life event for anyone who has to go through that. With the analysis, they had a, they had a team, a multidisciplinary team. They had a cardiovascular surgeon. Um, they had a professor of design, they had a, a professor of fashion, stuff about the body, um, and they had a uh, participant activist researcher. They, ha they just had a very sort of multi multidisciplinary team and they spent about a year analysing all the text that they got from all the interview transcripts and the journals. And they talked a lot, they read it a lot and they talked a lot and they looked at key phrases and ideas and concepts and metaphors and they, they wrote poems and they produced images which were their distillations of the real meat, the real key points from the data. And then the dissemination was that they used those images and those poems within a massive installation which people could walk through, it represented the journey that a patient takes. So from preparation, um, pre-op, the central part was the operating theatre and then afterwards in hospital and going home and then recovery, kind of, that was the kind of way it went. So pretty impressive. Now clearly I can't show you that, but I can show you a very short video. I think when people talk about research using technology, people listening sometimes think that technology equals new and shiny, um, but it doesn't necessarily at all. We all use technology and have done it for a long time. You know, these are going to be very familiar to people. Some people may remember this one. Um, and there is also the new and shiny, but, you know, quill pens were technology too in their time. So in terms of research using technology, you, you will all be already using smartphones, email, perhaps um, computer-assisted data analysis software, that kind of thing. Um, it's particularly useful for collaboration, of course, uh, but really at every stage of the research process, potentially. It's not always brilliant, is it, technology? <laughs> it's not always the best thing. Um, but it is, when it works and when it does what you need it to do, it can be enormously useful. It's also important to remember, and this is a key ethical point, that technology does change our practice as researchers. It affects how we practice, um, and we need to be aware of that and at least understanding and knowledgeable about it, ideally to, somewhat, to some extent in control of it. So there are some problems with research using technology, the first being that not everyone has access, and that access itself is not an absolute or a binary 
So if you have a family of six who between them have one smartphone with a cracked screen, and that is the sum total of their hardware, and they need to use that for everything from the online shopping to the kids' homework, to the web browsing, to the, you know, whatever it is. Um, how much access does every member of that family really have to technology? It's, it's quite limited. Um, so if you're doing research around people with technology, you need some awareness of the limitations of that and not to think. I'm, I, I was doing some research in the UK last year and I was finding people said, but everybody's got a laptop. I was thinking, you know, we really don't. Um, there's also serious ethical issues around research using technology. So social media, research using social media is quite a big thing at the moment. If you take uh, data, say, from blogs and you anonymise it, that's all very well and good. You can decide whether you need to ask for consent or not. There is a big debate about that. But you need to be aware that if you use direct quotes and then someone puts a quote into a search engine, they get straight back to that blog. It doesn't matter how anonymised you've made them in the research report, they're still vulnerable to being identified. Um, so all of those kinds of issues. And other ethical options are, for example, when you're doing data analysis, if you're a quantitative researcher, you put all your results into SPSS and you think, oh, look at all these tests I can run on, you know, I'll run the whole lot. And then you find that some of them give you significant results. You think, whoopee, my research is great. And that's wrong because you need to know which tests are appropriate for your sample size and for your uh, research questions and so on. And with presentation, you know how PowerPoint can have you know, so many charts and graphs on a slide that you have absolutely no idea what's really going on there. That's not very helpful. So, but there are a lot of pluses too. So consent being really more of a process than an event, certainly for some groups, um, technology can support that. So people with learning disabilities or people with dementia um, can have the project explained in a little uh, video or a little podcast so that they can play it again when they need to. With children, you can make them a little video with cartoon characters to explain the research, not to talk down to them, but to make it engaging and help them to understand and to start forming a relationship with the concepts that you're trying to present. Online surveys are, you know, again, pros and cons, but you can have a huge survey online, but participants aren't daunted by its size because they only actually have to answer 10 questions because they can navigate, you know, depending on how they answer question one, they might skip straight to question 27. It's fine, but you can have a massive design behind the scenes. Um, video is great for observation because you can replay it. Uh, there was a guy in New Zealand who did what he called a compressed ethnography. He wanted to do an ethnographic study of a regatta uh, with yachting and so on. It lasted maybe 10 days, uh, but it was a very rich experience and he was participating. So he did loads and loads of videoing and then spent years replaying the videos and um, kind of looking at them and reflecting on them over time. Uh, so that's you know, a different way of doing ethnography. Although if you are going to use video, obviously there are big implications for the analysis stage, because that's hard work. Technology is great for collaboration, but also for reaching participants who you can't necessarily reach. You know, Skype interviews are great because they're another dimension over phone interviews and there's no geographic barriers, although of course there are technological barriers. Um, and it's great for teaching. And of course, access to data. There's so much data out there now, um, so many repositories and more being added all the time, government data, health data, the kind of data that we as social scientists are going to find really very useful. So this was a nice example. A Dutch ethnographer went to Baltimore of a city he didn't know to do an ethnographic, to live there and do an, this ethnographic study. Baltimore's a city that's designed for cars. He didn't have a car. He found public transport confusing, he found walking difficult, he got lost a lot. And in the end, he decided to get a smartphone for the GPS to help him find his way around Baltimore. But then he quickly found it had lots of other uses. He was using it to record, to photograph, to, to do little videos, to make field notes, and of course, to call up and text and keep in touch with his participants. But it wasn't all marvellous. Things went wrong. I mean, pocket dialing your participants at inconvenient hours of the night is not ideal. Um, the GPS didn't even work that well, so he still got lost. Um, but what he found very much was that it was overall a help, and it changed the way he did research. He worked differently because he had a smartphone <coughs> than he would have worked if he hadn't had a smartphone. Doesn't make it better or worse, just different. Then, of course, mixed methods, which probably you know more about than the other areas. You probably know that traditionally that was quant and qual because it was never the twain shall meet. And then somebody said, oh, I've had a radical idea. Let's talk to those people on the other side and see what they're about. Um, but now you can do 
research that's purely quantitative or purely qualitative and still mixed methods, that's recognised. Um, and again, traditionally, it was about mixing at the data gathering stage, but now people mix it up every stage of research or any. It doesn't have to be every stage, but there's potential for mixing methods at any stage of the research process. And what mixed methods research is pretty much for is research questions that are just too, too complicated for a single method. Um, takes more resources, can be conflicts, can be difficulties, integrating findings. You've got different data sets, that's fine. You analyse each one, but then trying to work out what they mean collectively can be a real challenge, especially if you get conflicting results. Um, the key point with it is to plan it because what you don't need to do is get halfway through a research project, get into difficulties and just throw a few more methods at it to see if that will help. Uh, people do. It's not a great idea. And there's some good literature around this. There's a couple of good books, Tasha Corey and Tedley or whatever they're called, and Creswell and Plano Clark, and there are journals of mixed methods. So of the four, this is probably the most mature. Lovely example. I really like this one. Um, this was Lund. And why I like this is because it goes all meta. Um, there was a first research team, and they, they did work collaboratively. It's not an example of collaboration failing. They really, really tried, but they couldn't integrate the findings. You know, I was saying this can be a difficult stage of the process. So the funders then got some new researchers in to research the research methods. Oh, I love that. Um, and they looked to find why it was difficult. What were the problems? What were the barriers to integrating those findings? And this is what they came up with, that there were differing views. They hadn't really done enough communication at the start, perhaps. Um, nobody was really taking a lead. They were perhaps being too collaborative, where it needed someone to say, right, we need to go this way now. And they struggled because the findings were contradictory. So instead of accepting that and seeing it as perhaps a way to spin off to a next research project, they just got bogged down in it and, and founded. So um, that's quite exciting. And then the fourth pillar is these uh, transformative research frameworks. And this is very much about research ethics moving beyond do no harm and moving towards the premise that actually we're all in social science to try and improve things for people and society and the world, if we think about it. And we'd do better to acknowledge that and be upfront and say, yeah. And so there are a bunch of these kinds of frameworks, at least some of which I'm sure everyone here has come across and heard of. Um, and they've, they've existed in kind of little silos uh, it, until really now, I think. The last six months of this year, there are three books out. Um, Research Justice, edited by Andrew Jolivet, published by Policy Press. Um, the Responsible Methodologist, which is coming out, came out from Left Coast Press, I think, last month. And then there's one on participation and storytelling by Victoria Foster from Routledge next month. And they are bringing together some of these methods and starting to say there is... Um, a discussion to be had here about what is common to, to each of these uh, methodologies. So a lot of it's about creativity. These are methods that are about we will do research ourselves rather than having it done to us. They've all come out of sort of service user movements or um, human rights movements. They're all very creative and there is an interesting link between creativity and ethics which is evidence-based and is playing out in these methodologies around the world right now. So as I've said, moving towards social justice. And another question it raises is, if you have to tangle with research ethics, does that just mean filling in a form and then ticking it off once you get your approval? Or is it, in fact, something that you need to engage with throughout the research process in terms of ethical thinking and ethical decision making? So the point of the transformative research frameworks, all of them, are to address and reduce power imbalances within the research process, but also ideally more widely. And there are examples of this. There's some lovely work been done with critical communicative methodology in Europe, which has led to Roma people um, getting a better deal in law. Whether it's led to them getting a better deal on the street is still questionable, but there is now there are now much better laws about equality and human rights for the, in, for the nomadic Roma peoples of Europe as a result of a particular transformative research framework being employed to work with and for those communities. There's no room for tokenism. It's, these frameworks seem so lovely, and you read about them, and you think, oh, this is marvelous. It's really good. I want to do good things because I'm a good person, and it's all very fabulous. Um, but it's also really challenging and really hard. 
um, as a researcher, doing participatory work well or decolonizing work well demands more of you yourself than doing other more traditional methods where you can re remain to an extent detached. Um, they're very much about privileging everyone's knowledge, not having this knowledge hierarchy that's in traditional um, terms we would think that professors are you know, terribly knowledgeable and important right on down to, I don't know, children probably, um, certainly women. And the key to it is finding out what people can bring, what their knowledge is, and using language that everyone can speak and everyone can understand. Uh, this is a bit strong, really. I should have said is unlikely to. I mean, there's, there are limits to the extent to which one research project is, is going to make a real difference. Um, the example I cited from Europe, there were actually several projects over a number of years, and it was a bit of a drip drip effect that actually led to, to real changes. But some do. Some do. There was a lovely mental health one about um, electroconvulsive therapy uh, run by service users, which led to changes in the way that that particular therapy is used. So it does and can happen. But there are also ethical difficulties within these frameworks. Every methodology or every method has its limitations. Nothing's right for everything, however virtuous or generally wonderful it may seem. And it's important to be alert to difficulties. So for example, if you want to do longitudinal participatory research, you're really going to have a job to find participants who think it's worth their while to, to join in with that. Um, Often these frameworks are deployed, but when it comes to writing, it's back to the scholars to do the writing. Uh, and that's not done in a, in a kind of participatory way or users are not empowered to produce those outputs and so on. So I'm going to give you an example. We'll have another short video and then you get to ask me some questions. Um, this is again from Canada. Really nice piece of work. They had a research team which involved people from the community and people from the academy working very closely together. This actually uses all of the four pillars of um, creative research methods in the one project. Another reason it's an example that I wanted to share with you today. So they took technology, um, not, that these, not that the Rigolette community had no technology, but they took video cameras and stuff, microphones and you know, useful things, and left them there as well. But they took them and did these week-long workshops supporting community members to do digital storytelling, to tell their own stories about the impact of climate change on their community. Um, and they talked a whole lot and they did all this, they did photos, they encouraged people to bring their own artwork, their own music, to create or use stuff they already had created um, in their stories. And they had um, showings of the draft stories and talked together and gave feedback on each other's outputs and so on. And at the end of each week, they had a kind of celebratory event where they looked at all of the stories that had been created during that week. 